Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the webinar on marketing value added grains for local and regional food systems. I'm Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and this webinar will last about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. So today, I would like to welcome our two presenters, two leaders in the local grains movement, June Russell and Amber Lamke. June is currently the Director of Regional Food Programs at the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. That's in Cold Spring, New York. And June previously spent 17 years with Grow NYC, where she spearheaded Grow NYC Grains to develop a market for regional grains. June has acted as a value chain coordinator and strategist for the revival of grains and other foods in the Northeast over the past decade. Amber Lampke is the founder and CEO of Main Grains Inc., which is carried by specialty food stores and used by bakeries, breweries, and chefs throughout the Northeast. She's also the founding director of the nonprofit Main Grain Alliance, whose flagship event, the Kneading Conference, attracts attendees from around the world each year. Amber has worked with local business leaders and community members to successfully bring the cultivation and processing of grains back to the Northeast. So with that, I'm going to pass over the presentation to our first presenter, June Russell. Thank you, Alice. Um, and yeah, thank you, Amber, for taking time out of your busy mill schedule to, to be I'm looking forward to your presentation as well. Glenwood is based in the Hudson Valley uh, in Cold Spring, New York, and it's dedicated to regional food and farming. Uh, there are four core areas where we work. Uh, there's farmer training, there's local food for every table, uh, building coalitions and educating stakeholders. And, uh, a lot of the this grains work uh, falls into many of those buckets. So uh, it's been good to take some of the grains work to Glenwood and build on uh, the previous decade with Grow My Sea. I won't spend a lot of time on some of these slides, but just to give some background of how I got into this space and working with this space was back in 2004, Green Market had been talking about how bakers could be more mission supportive in terms of uh, supporting regional agriculture through baked goods. And I picked up that conversation circa 2007 and uh, tried to uh, see if there was such a thing as local grains. And so, you know, just wanted to pause uh, and think back a little bit of what that landscape looked like at that time. Um, and certainly many of our mentors uh, coming from the organic community um, as, you know, coming from my position in the organization and, you know, holding this question of, is there such a thing as a local flower? Uh, the folks who were uh, working in this space were largely organic and the and looking to add value to small grains because they were necessary in organic crop rotations. So, um, you know, just thinking back 15 years ago, what was really available in this space, uh, of course, Manure Milanese has been a really important mentor to many of us in the Northeast, um, an organic operation up in Quebec, Canada, um, that really started working with farmers and created a new organic brand of flour um, that was uh, certainly distributing to a lot of very good bakeries at that time. Aurora Mills did a bread early on with Borealis Breads, demonstrating that this could be done, that uh, we could get some bread wheats from the Northeast and they could make decent breads. Um, certainly Nofa New York uh, was very important player and partner in the first round of this project, uh, as was Ogren and Elizabeth Dick. Um, you may recognize some of these other names, uh, Klaus Martins at Lakeview Organic Grain, Jack Laser, Ellie Ragosa, all really important uh, early champions of the need to get small grains back into production on farms. And I, I want to emphasize this as, you know, we definitely are in a new era and we'll get into this some more, but um, that the original intent went, was uh, really in relationship with our farms and developing food culture uh, in tandem with uh, our farming systems and, and the kind of markets we need to develop to support healthy farming systems. Uh, this was a piece that, you know, these folks were well aware of early on. I think it's taken 
you know, the rest of us many years to understand the importance of uh, soil health and role in uh, such things as climate change mitigation. Anyway, um, I think, you know, there was uh, very little, let's say, in the supply chain at the time. And, you know, again, coming from the perspective of green market, we were looking at uh, really developing value chains. And there's a great definition here that came out of the Wall Center in 2014 and how value chain is different than a supply chain. You know, I think of a, a standard supply chain as trying to get something from you know, A to B as quickly and cheaply as possible. Uh, a value chain is really looking for impact. Um, it's also a very important point of differentiation. And when it came to green market, those priorities had to do with the geographical region, uh, the types of farms that we were supporting and looking for investments in local economies and rural infrastructure development. By 2009, we'd sort of identified you know, a handful of collaborators to create a policy that required uh, the green market bakers to use 15% uh, regional grain and flour. The impact of that helped to get the ball rolling, I'd say 65,000 pounds a month uh, from 32 bakeries it was about 300 acres. So we also realized that, you know, this small community of bakers wouldn't be enough to really get this sector off the ground. We needed our partners really in the local foods movement to get more in the game. Just want to note there that in 2018, Green Market did raise the required minimum for eligibility from 15% to 25%. I did those audits uh, both times, and it was a very interesting change in supply. I think the first uh, time we did those audits, there was a lot of a couple of producers that took the lion's share of that supply. Uh, the second time we did the audit, it was much more diversified and we saw a greater variety of grains. So it's been part of the maturity of this market is to see um, more diversity of grains that are, are being utilized. Our first round of this project was from 2011 and 2016. Value-added grains for local and regional food systems. That was anchored by Cornell, as is this one. Um, we had two trial plots at different Cornell locations, two at Penn State. We did quality evaluations on those and some sensory evaluations. And so that was really important baseline data for us. We just recently uh, completed another round of quality evaluations. And again, you really see the maturity of... Uh, the system, our knowledge base, the baker's knowledge base, um, and we'll be very excited to see, you know, a couple of new lines become more commercially available in a couple of years that uh, came out of this project. Um, some of the things we did in that first round was create these kinds of marketing and educational materials, uh, the grains guide uh, and a brochure that we created, you know, really just to keep prompting people to use their imaginations a little more. I mean, at the time we were really looking at, you know, 100% white flour. Um, and by continuing to kind of push people towards uh, some R&D, which is incredibly challenging when folks are in production, um, but we've seen a, lot, a big increase in, in uh, more varieties being utilized. This was also, it's through a different project, but I wanted to throw this in here as a resource for growers. Um, I think a lot of the information in there still stands, and hopefully we'll do an update on this. But you're really starting from a perspective of, you know, depending on where you are in your grain shed, in your bio bioregion, uh, what is going to, to work, what can you grow, and what can you grow well. Um, these are important considerations for our farmers. You know, looking at the market opportunities, um, there's some basic categories there, food grade and malting I put together. They're sort of the highest standard uh, to achieve. Um, there's a robust distilling market, um, animal feed, and then um, some markets that have grown for byproducts. This document also has good information on quality standards that growers need to be aware of before they sell off the farm. Um, there's a big issue here in the Northeast with Don and Fusarium. I'm always astonished when I go to your part of the world, Alice, and we don't have those problems. Uh, it's probably our number one issue. 
And there's also some tips on how to communicate about the, um, these types of grains and additional resources. In 2014, we did a pilot project sort of realizing, tried to work with wholesale off the bat and um, it was very challenging. I think the ratio of accounts that we established to the amount of time spent by staff uh, was really um, dismal at that time and realized that bringing these products into the commercial space, um, we were really talking about different products and I've come to think of them as very different. So, you know, we know now that wheat is not wheat, um, that um, anything outside of the commodity system is going to have uh, some variability to it. And we needed a way to get um, more consumers um, handling and working with grains that we had convinced farmers to grow, frankly. Uh, so that strategy was by, uh, you know, a green market. Our greatest asset was the network of markets that we have and set up a tent and table and, and started um, a little uh, operation to aggregate and uh, do continued outreach and education uh, with consumers uh, through the green market network of farmers markets. So in the course of those seven years, we worked with 21 different regional mills and processors. Um, our last tally of how many farms were feeding into those businesses was about hundred farms from across the Northeast. Uh, we were able to introduce 57 new crops to the grain stand and 20 regionally adapted wheat varieties, um, which was really amazing and also really fun. And, and to the extent that once our uh, curious and motivated bakers uh, tapped into that, there was a lot of interest uh, for them to, to handle different things and try to understand what those differences are. And we were able to provide feedback um, to growers and millers based on what we were seeing and hearing. Um, we also had a component where we were able to give market space to uh, New York State farm distilleries and New York State farm breweries, and uh, we had three seed oil producers pass through as well. So at the end of 2021, we conducted a survey. I had moved to Glenwood just a few months before that, but we uh, still worked with Grow NYC to uh, create the survey, and we executed that this in the fall of 2021. And the summary happened in 2022. Um, and a few, a few of the key findings there, um, of course, was that the grain stand was a really important place for uh, gaining knowledge and uh, being able to talk to the representatives who were there. And we clearly saw that 90% of our respondents discovered new products through the grain stand. So it was a really important place uh, of outreach uh, at that really critical time of launching, you know, what then was a pretty new idea of, you know, a, a local grain economy and, and having uh, multiple mills come online in those, those early days. Um, some of the demographics that we saw, reminder, we're here based in New York City. Um, and I was describing to Allison Amber earlier that these numbers were a little bit skewed in that we've got a lot of respondents from Union Square, um, even though we were, had operations happening in a, a dozen other neighborhood locations. Um, but we did see that uh, the majority of the customers were home cooks, 4% were small scale producers. And I would just note that many of those small scale producers were micro bakeries or micro bakeries that then launched and have now become uh, established bakeries. And so, you know, on that list is Lost Bread, Need Love, uh, Mel the Bakery, ACQ, which has now uh, joined the market about a year ago. So also, again, a really important way for us to reach those, what we refer to as less than wholesale customers. You know, we found that, yeah, the spend, you know, on average was 11 to $20. 30% um, were spending more than $20. And that's really kind of our avid home bakers. And we did see quite a few repeat customers there. And, you know, that 41% that shop once a month or more was just kind of confirmed an assumption that we had had that when it comes to the staple goods, 
people might buy once a month rather than for produce, you know, it's weekly or in New York City, you know, multiple times a week because of smaller spaces. So in terms of motivation, um, again, you know, we have to look at the, the source of where we're conducting the survey. You know, we're in the farmer's market, green market in New York City. We already have a committed customer base that, you know, I talk about crossing the street uh, to come into the farmer's market versus several other uh, grocery stores that are nearby. Um, and that is a motivation to support local agriculture and local farmers. Uh, the quality was a very important motivator. This is one question I wish that we had gone a little uh, more in depth on to understand what did quality mean to consumers exactly? Is that nutritional quality? Is that the uh, actual quality of the grain or flour itself, um, just to understand a little bit more about that. And we did see a uh, preference uh, for local over organic. Uh, again, I think that some of that may have been because of our customer base that's already a farmer's market shopper. Just wanted to show an example of 2.0, um, the folks down at Common Grain Alliance and Fresh Farm Market have gotten some LFPP funding to do a model based on what we did in New York City. And last year was their first pilot year of a grain stand, and this will be their second year. That's really exciting. Uh, also, you know, they'll be learning different lessons than we did because of, uh, you know, different assets and the different organizations that are participating there. But um, they were able to take our model and build on that. And work with that alliance of producers in the mid-Atlantic uh, to get more products to consumers through, you know, really, really fantastic markets in the Washington, D.C. area. So looking ahead and, you know, where this market is going, I've really described this as happening, kind of the vertical and the horizontal. Uh, we've got several crops and um, ingredients that are coming to scale, you know, that's primarily uh, all-purpose flour, bread wheat, bread flours, and just to really emphasize the fact that the Northeast has um, what maybe a half a dozen good bread flours is a really massive achievement for this community of practice that we have here. Um, 20 years ago, people have said this couldn't be done. And so the fact that we've got really great flowers that are coming out and bakeries, you know, I think there were uh, three James Baird nominees this year that are working with local grains. And so, you know, that was another what a, um, obstacle that we had early on because bakers were very skeptical that they would be able to make good bread with anything that came out of the Northeast. So yay for us. The other part on the horizontal is really, you know, I would say the broader, um, the broader crops uh, that really reach our biodiversity goals. And, you know, I would say, you know, small, small, but growing markets for rye, emmerfaro. Uh, we've been working on the hose barley um, on another OREI project. Uh, and those are really important crops to keep nurturing. We want the ultimate goal there is to have more of these be viable for our growers to use in their farming systems. And the more of those that we have, uh, the healthier our system can be. Um, our barriers are still having adapted seed, um, although to see the progress from these latest round of baking trials, um, we keep moving closer to that where we're getting more uh, seeds adapted to the Northeast region um, that can move into commercial production. Now that said, this has been over a 10 year process. So I've really been in awe of how long uh, this development can take and really appreciating thinking more in decades than uh, you know maybe a couple of two year time cycle. Um, and also so important that we keep investing in these breeding programs um, prior to these uh, grant projects, Cornell was not doing organic research in the Northeast. So this uh, particular OREI grant has been, I think, very significant. Uh, and we just put in for a renewal. So there's my pitch that they'll continue to fund this work. Um, you know, and then the, the final barrier there is certainly market access. It's still challenging for small growers, uh, you know, our established producers, who came in early have good brand recognition and market share, 
but how do we keep this space open for new producers coming into the market? Um, we still hear a lot of issues around supply chain uh, and last mile distribution. I hear constantly in New York uh, that it's a challenge to still receive uh, local grains and people are looking for those products. Um, we'll keep working on trying to address that. And then obviously, you know, inflation is, is a big one as we're in the folks in their personal pocketbook being impacted and maybe having to make different choices. I want to give a, a pitch before I wrap up here. Uh, we have been working to promote markets for rye. Um, one thing I've seen in working with our farmers, both organic and conventional, uh, is that rye has been, you know, think of that as a really good starter crop for, for our farmers. Uh, it's one, um, it's very forgiving. You know, another term we like to use for rye is it's very scrappy. Uh, it does well in our marginal conditions here in the Northeast. And um, we've got a growing demand for that through uh, the uh, crop cover crop seed alone. There's a giant demand for more cover crop seed. And we're seeing more products made with rye in baked goods and uh, just a flurry of articles in the last six months around rye whiskey and rye spirits and just uh, kind of an explosion of, of interest in rye spirits. So you know, it's an area that we'll keep working on, but uh, make sure you get some of your rye products. Uh, and yeah, this is my last slide. So, you know, one thing I realized is that people I wanted people to understand the, the extent of this project and how big and broad it is. Um, a lot of Northeast, uh, Upper Midwest collaborators on this grant. And yeah, a few on the West Coast, the Organic Culinary Breeding Network. And that's it. I will stop share and pass to Amber. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Amber from Maine Grains. Um, so happy to be with you, uh, June. It's been a long time. We we go back a ways, and um, as an advisor to uh, this grant project, I'm happy to be with you today to try to focus on marketing. And um, June, my my new Trina Hanneman uh, cookbook just arrived yesterday. All about seventy ways to serve open faced rye sandwiches. <laughs> so I think it's going to be my new favorite lunch for a while. Um, pleased to be with you. I'm coming to you from Maine Grains in Skowhegan, Maine, um, I, where I started a mill in 2012 with my business partner, Michael Scholes, really to try to solve an infrastructure challenge in the state of Maine. Um, I was part of a grassroots group of folks here that started conversations in 2007 um, at the Needing Conference. We, we decided that we were interested in having food grade grains in this region again. And we knew that as backyard gardeners and farmers, we were growing a lot of oats and rye and cover crops in our state, but bakers were having a hard time accessing food grade grains. So the needing conference was an opportunity for us to bring bakers and millers and farmers and oven builders together to begin conversations, really first to understand what was happening in the region um, who had some expertise and knowledge, and then figure out what the pinch points were at the time. And I would say those pinch points have changed because we've been making progress. We've been growing. But at, at this point in time, the pinch point was really, we didn't have machines to adequately clean out weed seeds and vetch from grains. We didn't have any dehullers in the state that could take the husky coating off of oats or spelt or, or barley. and um, that was preventing some of those grains from getting to market. And I will say at this time in 2007 in Maine, there was some effort at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension uh, to be working with dairy farmers in Maine who needed organic straw for their dairy barns uh, because it was part of the organic system. And we weren't growing enough grains in Maine, organic grains, to have the straw in state for that need. So importing organic straw was coming at great expense to organic dairy farmers. So there was an effort to start paying attention to growing grains on farms again, really to solve feed and straw. 
And then they became the earliest adopters to trying to grow some food grade grains for our, I'm gonna use the term value chain, but then I'm also gonna uh, uh, um, sort of, I, I had an interesting note here to talk about clusters um, as part of the inspiration for the Needing Conference. And now we use this term value chain a lot. I'm not opposed to the term chain, but when I think about chain, I think about links and I think about um, sort of uh, something linear, you know, that it starts at seed or farm and it ends at consumer. And one of the inspirations actually for the Needing Conference was that in 2006, in Maine, we had just completed an economic study in the state with the Brookings Institution um, around how to successfully develop the economy of Maine. And one of the concepts they wanted us to think about here was the concept of clusters. Now, they weren't talking about grain and ag. They were actually thinking um, about marine clusters and technology clusters. And we had um, an entrepreneur had launched um, IDEX labs doing uh, veterinary medicines and then had launched many other companies and spin-off um, organizations that really all clustered around veterinary medicine. So they were encouraging Maine to think like clusters. Well, when this discussion about grains and bread started, we thought, oh, well, we're a cluster. I mean, you need all of these people in the circle to make this all work. There's you know, brewers, maltsters, uh, distillers, uh, you know, farmers, but then everything in between. There's, there's, the, there's home bakers, there's folks that want to use straw, other byproducts, they want mulch, they want um, compost, like, you know, we have a compost customer who displaces vermiculite in his potting mix with oat hulls. You know, there's, we, there's all these places to fill in people in the cluster. So I think of us kind of as a as a circle, um, um, but in any event, that's just conceptual. So um, what we ended up doing was we bought an old Victorian jailhouse in the downtown of Skowhegan to start our business and situate the infrastructure that would help make more products possible to go to market. Um, today was a very exciting day here at the mill. We just installed our third Austrian stone mill into the building. Uh, we've been, had that machine on order for over a year. Um, it needed to be, we were in the queue, then it needed to be specially built, then it needed to take a long trip over the ocean to get here. So uh, it landed on March 31st, and uh, we had a company in here today basically putting that huge millstone up on the third floor of this building, which takes chain lifts and telescoping forklifts, and it's quite an operation. And so Stay tuned on Facebook or uh, Instagram. I'll be posting those later today so you can have a peek. Um, so this is what we're doing. We're in the center of our downtown. Um, we're going to be talking about marketing as I go through my slides. So, you know, the first thing I have to say about marketing here is uh, I never really realized until we did this uh, what a huge impact it would have on our business to situate in a highly visible crossroads of of the East West Highway and the Northwest Highway that come through my town. We could have done this project out on a farm or in a barn and we did look at other properties, but um, so much free advertising and marketing has come from just being visible. Um, advertising and marketing, we never had to pay for it. The project was a little quirky. The TV stations, we were right on their roots. So if they're if they're driving out to go get a story someplace else and driving back to the studio, they're driving right by here. So they would stop in unannounced just for the latest on what you were up to. So um, ultimately, we've just uh, uh, celebrated 10 years in business. We've created um, close to 20 jobs in the mill and another 20 or so jobs in a cafe that is also housed in our building called the Miller's Table that uses our products on the menu. Uh, we are specializing in freshly milled flour that is um, milled, shipped, and um, shipped out within seven to 14 days of, of an order. Um, and that is different from the way the commodity flour system works. So all of these unique things that you're doing or um, unique ways that you're making a high quality product 
there's a story to tell about all of those. And it, it ultimately impacts the entire system and flow of your sales um, and your, your customer base. Uh, I will mention before I move to the next slide that you know we will in another decade have staff from small regional mills that have expertise in milling. But in the last 10 years, when we started this business, no one comes to you knowing about milling. Uh, there's only a couple places to formally be trained in flour milling. Um, there's the Kansas State University's program um, at the International Grains Program. You can go to Switzerland. I went to a week-long course in Kansas, and it's entirely focused on white flour milling. So there were no, there was not a single resource in the library there on stone milling. So you know what you can appreciate about that is that this is a peer-to-peer -peer network that is forming. We're sharing information with each other. Um, you know, we have countless connections now in the other um, regional um, grain clusters, if you will, that are willing to connect with us and share. And really, that's how we are building up a new generation of knowledgeable people, which is exciting. Um, June asked me to focus a bit um, on uh, kind of how do you decide? Are you going to be about bulk uh, sales or retail sales? How do you work with distributors? What's the messaging? What does the marketing look like? So I'm going to try to touch upon some of those things. Um, this is literally the picture of the first ever distributor pickup at our mill. <laughs> and it's with Down East Foods. It's, it's basically Maine's distributor that specializes in serving bakery goods um, to corner bakeries. And it was an interesting first partnership for us because they don't necessarily specialize in organic foods or local foods at all. They specialize in bakery products. So, you know, our product is getting loaded on the truck alongside, you know, bake and joy tubs of muffin mix and things like that. But they had distribution figured out. They had a route that hit every corner of Maine and they knew the bakeries of Maine. So, um, so we do work with distributors. We now work with probably a couple dozen of them. Um, I made a decision with this business that I think was the right one early on to be nimble with distributors. Um, knowing that every distributor you choose to work with has a different niche. They reach a different zone. They have different ways of doing business and they have different margins that they take for the work they do. Think of your distributor as someone that has someone that has to add value to your product, they're going to take a margin on your product. They have to be able to define and deliver on some added value, whether that value is reach or sales force or customer service or whatever it is. Know what that is and how it helps your business. Um, early distributors wanted us to sign exclusive agreements and we steered away from that. Like, they wanted to be the only distributor that would distribute your product. And we said, no way, there's, there's too many idiosyncrasies in this business. Like we need to get to that corner over there and you don't go there. Um, or, or we need someone who specializes in local products to get into that location. So we need that distributor also. So, so we remained nimble and I think that was the right choice. Um, Pre-COVID, our business was 90% wholesale. So big bulk bags to bakers and brewers um, and chefs, 90% uh, wholesale, 10% retail. And this is what our retail packaging family looks like right now. When COVID hit, we really, um, we overnight went to 50-50, 50% bulk and 50% retail. It was a wild ro roller coaster ride, really. Um, and, uh, and we were fortunate to be able to have some semi-automated equipment to be able to get product into retail size bags. We had a design strategy that allowed us to create retail labels. Um, we had distribution to corner stores and markets, um, thanks to our partners all over the Northeast, to be able to get these products um, uh, to the retail customer. Um, we had an online platform. All of those things really cued us up to be helpful in COVID where people um, weren't getting out to grocery stores and of the two primary things that freaked people out <laughs> in grocery stores when they ran out toilet paper and flour, it sent everyone online to look for those things. Um, 
And so literally kind of overnight, we lost our biggest customer in New York City the same week that to uh, toilet paper and flour ran out on the grocery store shelves. And we just went underwater with online sales for a good six months. I think at its deepest, we were 3,000 orders deep lining our hallways with three to four boxes deep on each side of the hallway. Um, and, and, and the turnaround time, which was lengthy for some people, um, the cause of that was the time it took to mill and package. It was not lack of grain. It was not lack of packaging, fortunately, although that part of um, the supply chain uh, was definitely disrupted. Packaging supply chain was disrupted through COVID. But um, but really, it was a time to mill and package. And you even saw large commodity mills struggling with this um, through COVID because um, it, it just takes time to get it all into bags and get it out to stores and whatnot. So there, there was a bottleneck there for a while that we, we climbed out of. Um, during that period, uh, I happened to pick up the phone one day um, when Timothy Wu, this opinion writer from the New York Times, was calling to find out what the what the heck is the frenzy about flour? What is going on? And um, you know, he was looking for a story about um, depletion of supply in grocery store grocery stores, a sourdough frenzy at home. People are home baking. What's this all about? Um, but he ended up hearing the story of main grains and the the upstart of a regional mill that helped restore. Um, a product like this uh, to the Northeast along with our partners. And it was not a story he was familiar with. Uh, he was actually preparing, uh, you know, we are, we are mentioned here alongside King Arthur Flower who experienced something similar in terms of a, a wild ride through COVID. But he came away uh, from writing this story just with a feeling that that flower you bought could just be the future of the US economy. That these are viable, interesting, creative solutions for regional economies and uh, for improving the kind of decline that we've seen in rural areas like my hometown with the loss of industry and manufacturing. Um, I'm going to switch gears just for a quick second. I swear I only have two slides with text on them. Um, the rest are just narrative and story. But um, this adoption of innovation curve has been really impactful for how I think about taking products to market and how I think about a new business. Um, my, my familiarity with this concept came from the YouTube, I'm sorry, the, um, the TED Talk uh, done by Simon Sinek on the power of why. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. Um, but he was talking about messaging and, and how um, effective messaging needs to lead with why and people need to understand why you're doing what you're doing to care about your product and whatever it is that you're selling. And he references the blue curve here. He, he references it as the adoption of innovation. If you Google it and you look it up, you'll also see it called the diffusion of innovation theory um, that comes out of um, some impactful research. But the idea here is that the adoption of your product, if you will, we're talking about grains today, starts with um, the innovators and the early adopters. They're the first ones that are going to buy your product. And they're the ones that wished your product existed before you existed. And so now that your product is there, they're ready. They are going to adopt it fast. And um, they're going to be some of your authorities and, and key critical thinkers that are going to help go tell the rest of the world about these cool products that are now available. Um, this section here um, in the hump, you have the early majority. OK, so that's that's when kind of everyday users of flour are starting to wake up and say, oh, there's something different. Oh, I didn't know that about white flour. I didn't know that um, this could work for this uh, or be interchanged. And so there's an awakening, if you will. The late majority is, as it sounds, those are going to be the folks that aren't really going to adopt your product till the innovators, early adopters, and early majority have already successfully used your product. Then maybe they'll be convinced. And then there's the laggards at the very end. Those are the ones that just no way, no how, not going to spend the extra money. I'm not going to try it. I'm not going to change my recipe. It's too much work. 
um, good luck to you, but not for me. Those are the ones that really are not gonna touch your product until everyone else is. Um, this was helpful to me because, you know, if you're in the grain business on this call, you're making cold calls or you're reaching out to customers. And when you get that customer that says, um, uh, do you know how hard it has taken me to start this donut shop? I have a recipe that is foolproof and um, I cannot afford to spend any more money on this. You know, my margins are so slim. You have a nice conversation and then you say, thanks so much. You know, best of luck to you. Sounds like you have something that works for you. And you kind of can plunk them in a laggard category, but don't worry about them too much because um, they may come around someday, just not now, right? And on the flip side of the coin, you can think about your early adopters and who your earliest pioneers and, and um, cheerleaders were and help use them to help bring along the rest of the majority. Um, we had an invitation at one point from Martha Stewart to be on her bake show. And to me, that was like a ding, ding, ding. We're entering the hump of the adoption of innovation because who does Martha reach? She, meets, she reaches all the interested creative home cooks of the world, you know, not, okay, not all of them, but, but, but she's in that sort of section. So anyway, um, I'm not going to read this to you, but there's stages of adoption. Um, basically that left-hand column, becoming knowledgeable and aware, um, being persuaded, making your decision, implementing your change. Then you need confirmation. Once you've implemented the change, you need confirmation that it works or it doesn't work. Um, and sometimes there are problems in the confirmation stage where something doesn't work and there's backpedaling and there, or there's adjustment that has to happen. So I'm going to I'm going to let you Google that. I'm not going to go into that too deeply. But, um, you know, when you're marketing products, you need to know what your customer needs. You know, where, you need to know where do they network? Where do you find them? Um, here's an example of a correctional facility just north of us in, here in Maine. Um, and we came to meet each other at a Farm to Institution New England conference where I was um, connecting with institutional users of these products and they have very different needs. In this jail, they needed affordability and they needed a flour that with one recipe, a hamburger bun recipe, could work to make hamburger buns, dinner rolls, hot dog buns, ciabatta, sandwich, you know, they wanted the one grandma's one hamburger bun recipe to work for everything so that they could teach inmates how to bake in the kitchen um, with uh, an affordable flour as part of a training program. So anyway, we were able to connect with um, this customer over our run of the mill flour, basically the flour that comes off our millstone every morning for the first minute. It's not quite the texture we want it yet. So we divert it, um, but it's still a food grade flour. It's just got variable particle size we were able to match um, a commodity flour price and sell um, what would otherwise be a wasted byproduct for us to this jail. So just making the point here about perspective taking, you need to know what your customer needs. Um, we have a brand new relationship. Uh, I'll give one more example with the Good Shepherd Food Bank here in Maine. And they have LFPP grant funds to be able to buy local food. Um, I'm sorry, that, that does... <laughs> LFPP funds don't qualify for bread, they qualify for uh, grains. Um, but understanding that customer's need, there are cultural considerations. Um, sometimes in the case of bread, uh, their customer base needs it sliced or it's, it's hard to utilize a loaf of bread. So bread slicing becomes important. Um, I'm gonna move on to just talking about um, this crop rotation line of uh, dry beans that we've been selling. Uh, through main grains and, and how it really tells an agricultural story in your marketing. Uh, we want our organic grain farmers also growing legumes and other rotation crops that maintain healthy soil. Um, we can play a part if we have a healthy um, cluster and customer base, we can play a part in helping them market their rotation crops. So we adopted this line really to do that um, and educate uh, our customers the importance of rotating and what that has to do with organic and soil management. Um, there's other stories to tell about this in terms of availability of grains and why something might not be available this year. Well, it's because the farmer had to take a break on that plot 
and grow something else. It'll be back in a year or two. Or um, it helps you to dictate how you manage your 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 farm planning with your farmers. You know, if you know that uh, farmer A is going to have to take a break from this crop, then maybe farmer B can be queued up in the off years. Um, packaging is part of marketing. Packaging is part of how you tell your story. Um, what I wanted to just say here is that when we started entering grocery stores, it became important to understand. Um, how to make nutrition labels and barcodes, and you must understand the FDA food labeling laws and what's required, um, what's required in the ingredient label, and then what's required in any alerts around allergens. Um, you must have some prescribed language if you process wheat or any other allergens in your facility, but the ingredient is not that allergen. So let's say I'm I'm packaging rye here, I have to also say that it is milled in a facility that also processes wheat. Right now, I will tell you that we're in a, in a package refresh where we're te tweaking some things and it is absolutely scaring me to death that we are still finding that we have to clean out errant soybeans in grain that comes to us because farms are managing soil health by growing grains and soy in the same year, very close to each other. And so on farm there, it is still very easy on farm for soy and wheat kernels to get into crop raw materials that are not soy and wheat and end up in what we're cleaning out. And that petrifies me. So um, we will add language now about um, the possibility of trace amounts of wheat or soy just to, just to make sure they're if there are any allergens out there that people are um, aware. Um, our first package didn't have recipes on it. And um, I went to the big E a number of years ago. And I can't tell you like the, the one conversation I had several thousand times was how to cook oatmeal. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I thought these are rolled oats. What do you mean how to, how do you cook oatmeal? But Sure enough, people are comforted by a recipe that leads them to a successful outcome. That's important. Um, we're learning more about our packaging all the time. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple more examples here. Um, uh, so we, we have a line of heritage grains. Um, you know, Here's a lovely picture of some heritage grains uh, that were at the kneading conference a few years ago. And we've got a color coding um, packaged line where we have a heritage line. Well. Um, you know, be aware that, uh, so be aware that there are different interpretations of words that we use, uh, and heritage is one of them. So in the grain community, different, um, uh, different people interpret heritage differently. Is heritage free chemical agriculture, free Norman Borlaug, pre 1940s? Is heritage something that's been passed down in your culture um, from small handfuls of seed and we're keeping something alive or we're, we're um, expanding the supply of it? Is heritage even earlier than, um, um, you know, 1900? There are different interpretations of this word and the consumer is confused. Um, we have heritage, we have land race, we have ancient, the consumer is confused, and we answer this question a lot. Um, um, doesn't heritage mean that um, I'm gonna? It's safe for people with celiac disease. Doesn't heritage mean that I'll be able to digest it better if I'm gluten sensitive? No, not necessarily. Unless I mean, we won't debate that here today. But there's new research suggesting we can't. We got to be careful what we say about this. Um, and FDA food labeling laws don't allow you to make health claims um, uh, unless you meet certain criteria. So again, that's important to know. Um, we just learned some new information about Cervinta that it's not as old as we thought. And so it doesn't meet the definition that I'm comfortable with with heritage, which is that I would want it to predate the 1940s. It doesn't meet that. So we've got to adjust our packaging. Um, but there are other words that create problems, sifted, all purpose, bread flour. What do we actually mean by those things? And sometimes we're confusing the public. All purpose flour, you can make bread. 11.5% protein is perfectly good protein to make bread. 
Um, European bakers that come to the kneading conference think it's ludicrous that we uh, Americans think bread flour needs to be closer to 13, you know, 12 and a half, 13 and a half, four, even 14 percent protein sometimes. So so we can be confusing sometimes. It's good to get customer feedback. Um, what confuses them? What do they want to hear? Um, June, one of your slides, I saw the word bolted. That means sifted, but not everyone knows that. But you'll see machines called bolters. Um, in this packaging, we chose to call out some of our partners. And in this case, um, this is a collaboration where we give 5% of the proceeds of this um, product back to the Somali Bantu community that grows this African um, corn for us. That can be useful in, in your storytelling. Um, I wanted to share um, just even another uh, a product that we have, Faro. Um, June, I heard you say Emmer Faro. We talk about Faro being the Italian term that describes any of the hulled wheats. There's Italian terms for Faro Piccolo, uh, which might be einkorn. Then there's Emmer, then there's spelt. Those could all be turned into Faro, but I've been challenged before that people thought that Faro was only Emmer. Um, we make ours out of spelt. Um, you'll hear, you, you'll you'll see online that some farrow is just described as um, pearled wheat. Uh, we have people coming to us that think farrow is not wheat. It's something other than wheat. And therefore it's safe for people who are gluten-free. No, no, like they need to understand that it is wheat. So um, you can end up in some challenges around um, how you talk about your product, but, but it's important to... Um, think these things through. This is another partner down in Arizona. I think they do a really nice job in their uh, marketing and their packaging, calling out some of the heritage varieties of grains and what's special about them. So I would urge you to just check out their website. They do a beautiful job um, in their uh, storytelling and marketing around different varieties. Um, I wanted to share an example of a brewery here in Maine that really helped to propel a marketing message around local grains several years ago. Um, you're seeing more and more of this now, but they came out with a flagship beer called 16 Counties, named after the 16 counties of Maine, with a pledge to use a million pounds of Maine grown grain with a within a certain deadline. Um, they give a, a portion of the proceeds of this beer back to the efforts that are helping the regional grain economy to grow and thrive. They're out on the roads of uh, the Northeast and the country telling the story for us, right? So, so sometimes these early adopters can help you tell your story about what you're doing and um, it goes a long way. So, so, so developing partnerships is really important to marketing. Um, I, I also wanted to touch upon, uh, just think about your channels. Uh, in our business development in the last 10 years, we really started our business with bakers in mind. And then in the first year or two, we realized that oats were like 45% of our business. And that kind of, that surprised me and it didn't surprise me. It surprised me that, oh gosh, we hadn't really built this into our business plan, but it didn't surprise me because our climate is cool and moist. We grow oats well here. It's, um, it's a fairly easy thing to grow in Maine. Um, so, so different products and different preparation can open new channels for you entirely. So I think of our business now as bakers. Brewers came around a little later, uh, realizing that their primary ingredient, grains, could be a locally grown ingredient. Um, then chefs, once we had some products that were good for cooking, things like barley and farro and polenta and... Um, um, spoiler alert, we have grits coming soon. We figured that out. Um, but the other thing to think through is your, your home cook, your home baker. They're going to need something slightly different from you. Different packaging, like I said, different recipes, different storytelling. Institutions are a whole channel. Um, and so your business needs to decide, are you, you know, who do you want to serve? Or does serving a few of these channels help balance your business in some way in terms of seasonality or reach um, a branded product, like a retail bag, is how the customer is going to come to know you. The customer might not come to know you and your story if you are only wholesaling um, to others that will brand in whatever way they choose to. And that may be okay. There's a place for processors that are not front-facing. There is a place for that, and that's okay if that's what 
um, if that's what you decide for your business, but they help you achieve um, different things. We're now at a stage in our business where we work with some mentors and organizations in Maine um, that give us access to um, industry data through SPINs and Nielsen and things like that. So there's even more complex ways to get data about how certain families of products or your product are moving in certain channels if they're traceable by a barcode. Um, I just have a few slides left before we open up um, for questions. And um, I just wanted to, <laughs> this picture reminds me about stones because this is our de-stoner. Um, and, uh, you know, we have experienced our fair share of heartache over um, um, thrilling sales into certain channels where there is zero tolerance for stones or zero tolerance for a problem. And the larger you get and the, the more you're getting into larger channels, um, that can be the case. So um, we had a difficult crop year with a particular farm um, where there were lots of little stones in the grain. And we were working hard, hard, hard to use all of the tools at our disposal to get them out. Um, but you you incur one chipped tooth or one issue like that, and you create that dissonance that um, is in one of the prior slides around the adoption of innovation. You create dis dissonance, and um, it's very hard to recover from that to the point where you know, we, we were moving very, very high volume to um, a particular customer, but then the tolerance becomes zero for, you know, one small stone in, um, uh, you know, 20 tons is too much. Uh, so again, you, you, you live and learn from those kinds of issues. And again, for, uh, for us, that's coming back to some labeling revisions where just like in your packages of beans in the grocery store, you may want your packages to say, this is an agricultural product, please inspect for stones or please rinse or pre. Um, another amazing story I will share with you is that this winter, we went down to visit our friends at Hayden Flower Mill just to see their mill. They had been up to see our mill and they're processing hullless oats down there and in a tiny little machine. And and I was asking, you know, even hull oats, we run them through dehullers because there's still hulls on them. And if you don't run them through a dehuller, you will still have hulls in the oatmeal. Our customer base in the Northeast has been intolerant of oat hulls. That was the most common conversation we had in the first year of business was why there were hulls. We were still working to get them all out. Well, down at Hayden, they said, oh, no, we can't do a perfect job getting the hulls out. We just teach people that they need to cover the oats with water, swish it around, pour off the hulls, and then proceed with uh, cooking the oatmeal. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, my gosh, if I had known that <laughs> in our first year of business, you know, maybe I would have told a different story. But um, again, it's how you educate. It's what you get people used to. Um. Here's a new product that's a lot of fun that's coming out of the development of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in our area. Um, this is a new frozen pizza dough product made entirely with our grains. Happens to be a business that was just started by my twin sister, Heather. Um, but I'm sharing this slide with you because your, 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 um, your partners, your customers can be pioneers in creating new channels for you. So Heather comes out of an occupational therapy background. She understands school systems. This product was actually a life skills classroom project before it was a product, if you follow. So she worked with um, children with special needs to create products like this. She understood how to market it to teachers and um, families and, and food systems. So she's becoming an incredible ambassador for our flower and this product in schools where she understands the obstacles and can overcome them um, and get uh, school food service coordinators using um, these local products. And then, um, you know, here's a picture. This is my final slide. It's uh, 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 not that, not terribly interesting, but, but what this is, is um, a new black bean pasta that's being made in Portland by a chef partner of ours that was familiar with our flour. And we had a farm 
producer that had an abundance of black beans. And so we decided we wanted to try to market more of them for him. So we made a black bean flour this year. And this is a pasta that is 50% semolina and 50% black bean flour. And it is to die for delicious and high protein and checks a lot of boxes for what people are looking for in their diets right now. So taking new products to market can be difficult. There's a lot that goes with that, but it starts with finding a great product that pe people can taste and love, and then figuring out how to get it into the channels you want to get it into. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there and just, you know, close by summarizing that marketing is so many things. It's messaging, it's feelings you can create, it's how you communicate, it's how you package, it's um, it's where do you try to sell? It's what do you choose for advertising? All of those things are decisions you make in marketing. Um, um, and, you know, as you grow, you can do more if your marketing budget gets larger, but sometimes it's the grassroots word of mouth marketing that is the most impactful thing you can do. So um, in anyway, I want to stop there. So there's time for questions. Um, and thank you for your attention. And thank you, June and Alice, for the opportunity to be with you. Well, thank you, Amber. That was great. Yeah. And um, yeah, we have um, time now for questions and answers. So if you have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. So um, we had a question about, um, this one's for Amber, about the package weight. Um, David was wondering, why um, is it a 2.4 pound and um, 1,039 gram package? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, a five pound bag of flour is pretty standard when you're buying cheap white flour. Um, when you are buying a more expensive product, it can be helpful to be a smaller quantity so that there is less sticker shop, but also so that people use it up as a freshly milled product and then come back for more. Uh, when that freshly milled product is gone. June taught me a lot about what New York City customers need. And, um, you know, seeing some of uh, their kitchens down there in New York will, will help you understand that pantry sizes are small. People are shopping for groceries on foot. Um, you, it is a rare and certainly an Instagrammable photo of people lugging 50 pound bags of flour home to their Brooklyn flats, but that's, that's the rarity, not the common way to shop. So smaller packages are good for more urban areas. Sometimes, um, 2.4 pounds for us was that we found the bag first. We found the economical bag from the company we wanted to buy from. And we knew that we could get into a bag price point if we bought 25,000 units at a time, which was where we wanted it. Um, to make that bag look tall and substantial, two pounds looked too squat. To make it look taller than it was wide, 2.4 got us there. So that was a little bit arbitrary. And that was also um, after a study of grocery store shelves and who are we competing against? And what is the size of the shelf that we have to be occupy? What's the size of the shelf we need to occupy? Um, there are considerations with packaging, any package you choose around uh, the real estate width on a grocery shelf. Um, if you can limit your width, you might be able to get more SKUs approved. If you're too wide, they might not wanna, the grocery might not wanna give you that, men, that much width. Um, so it's all a study in where do you want to be on a shelf? Who are you serving? Um, what's the price point? Um, there are competitors that are out there with a two pound bag. I know that, um, there are, uh, colleagues of ours that are choosing a package weight based on FDA serving sizes. So you, if you want your package to be four servings even, and then that package will be gone and they'll come back for more when they want more, then that dictates the number of ounces. So you need to come at that decision from whichever angle makes the most sense to you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a comment here from Sarah, um, and um, she says the crop rotation packaging is genius. Anyone interested in joining a Miller's Forum, Stone Miller's of all scales, please email 
millers-peer-group at ruralaction.org to introduce yourself. And I'm just kind of reading that out loud for the benefit of those who might not have been able to make it today, but are watching the recording. So, um, okay, here's a question um, also from David. Um, he's interested in how Amber set main grains production capacity at startup. Were targets based on Brookings study, for instance, or was it a build it and they will come strategy? Ditto for your grain suppliers. Are they all local? Did you contract for estimated first year sales? Yeah, um, we we built a business plan. We worked with the Small Business Development Centers of Maine for counseling on trying to at least create a startup plan that seemed financially viable. Um, I visited mills in uh, Denmark and Germany to, to learn what were their capacities, how long did it take them to get there, and were they profitable, and at what level. So we had set a goal of 600 tons a year as our starting goal, knowing that it would take a few years to get there. Um, we are on track to process about 2 million pounds of grain this year. And the challenge now as we grow is just, you know, how much, how much more can your facility do or your equipment do, or, or, or when you get your third mill, now what pinch point do you create someplace else? You're, you're always gonna have a pinch point somewhere in your production. Um, challenge. I, I will say that what I've learned and was told by mentors early on, but have lived through is that um, this is a low margin industry. Um, no one's getting rich fast on milling and um, or farming for that matter. And so you need some volume to get to a break even place. Um, and it took us a long time um, to reach break even. So you have to raise a lot of money to get to your uh, break even point. And, you know, I was advised early on, you should raise twice as much as you think you need because you're going to need it. <laughs> and that is true. <laughs> um, and we got into our business and realized we needed yet more equipment to be able to do the things we wanted to do well. So. Okay. Um, here's a question from Vicki about whether or not table dehullers exist. I'm trying to find the word ta oh, table dehullers. Um, we have big dehulling machines from Germany. Um, our prior machine was a 1930s um, dehuller made in Iowa that really did not suit our needs for making food grade oats. It's how we got started, but we had to use a lot of other cleaning machines after the dehuller to get all the hulls out, in part because the dehuller was designed for um, dehulling oats to create pig food. <laughs> Um, so, so to this, to this point about heritage, pre chemical agriculture and pesticides, everyone was using oats or some sort of cover crop to manage perennial weeds. So in Iowa, they had a glut of oats. So, um, a family decided to invent a dehuller to fatten pigs up faster and create a hog industry in parallel to excess oats. Is there a tabletop dehuller? Um, I know there are some farm hack plans, open sourced plans that people are building. Um, I saw a primitive dehulling solution in Denmark on a farm that was basically like a 10 or 12 inch stone mill that the guy had put a rubberized surface on to basically abrade the hulls off that way. Um, there's impact dehulling and, um, um, but, but you can basically think of dehulling like scouring. So any way that you can scour um, to rub them off. Okay, um, we have some resources on the eOrganic website that were connected with the previous incarnation of this project on uh, dehulling um, ancient grain. So um, you might wanna go to the eOrganic website at eOrganic.org um, and look under the topic grains and um, you should be able to find it there. And there's also a website for the project um, that this is associated with, the NIFA OREI project, which is eOrganic.info slash value added grains. And I can put that in the chat box um, and all of the resources from that project are there. And, oh, look, we've got Brian here on the webinar who wrote that <laughs> article. And he said, um, there are lab dehullers and hand dehullers, lab de Dehullers are very expensive and have limited capacity, and hand dehullers are labor intensive and not very efficient. Um, economies of scale are very real. So thank you very much for that 
um, comment, Brian, and um, June posted a link to um, a SER project report as well. You want to comment on that, June? Oh, sure. This is some of Elizabeth Dick's work with um, Henry Byler and some folks in um, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, the farmer, the paper is farmer generated equipment solutions for producing and processing value-added grains. So I know that um, both Henry and Nigel Tudor at Weatherbury Farm have been able to develop some like, very small scale equipment like that. But to, to Brian's point, you know, it's um, it comes down to scale. Okay. And um, let's see, we've got some um, comments um, from Carl here in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, oh, he posted some links. Oh, he put those in the Q&A. So, Carl, if you want to share anything with the whole audience here, you can put those in the chat because um, I don't think the Q&A gets shared with everyone. Um, so if you'd like to do that, you can. Um, but uh, I guess Carl was wondering about the differences between heirloom, ancient heritage and land race grains, um, whether they're all the same or um, you know, so you want to speak to that? I just want to share real quick. I had a little laugh when you were talking about the definition of heritage. The other day I saw an ad on Instagram for heirloom overalls. And I <laughs> had a chuckle about that one. It's like, what makes those heirloom overalls? <laughs> Nothing tops the resilience pants that I saw. <laughs> Do you yeah. want to tackle this question, June, or do you want me to? <laughs> well, it looks like Carl actually post posted a link that goes through that. But if you want to discuss that, um, yeah. Great. Go, go There's on. lots of great pieces that have been written on this. So, you know, I won't try to cover too much, but but land race implies uh, regionally adapted varieties where, um, you know, take red fife, for example, that's one of the ones we carry. Um, it's grown in Canada. It's grown in Maine. Um, you would you would imply if you called something land race that it's been regionally adapted and it thrives in your climate. And maybe its characteristics have changed a bit um, based on regional adaptation. Um, we talked about heritage where I think there's a fuzzy line and what do you call it? Um, you know, I, I think if you Googled just what is the definition of the word heritage, if you remove yourself from the grain world, um, it's, it's much more general, um, grain people are, are, are narrowing that definition. Um, heirloom again, um, implies you need to decide what it means for you. And you need to try to put yourself in your customer's shoes and, and imagine what will they think it means, or what does it mean to them? Because both of those matter. Both of those matter. I work um, with a package designer who, you know, we brought this challenge to, to them and said, you know, we need a design solution that doesn't confuse people. And he said, well, I'll, I'll be completely honest that, you know, to me, I will presume it's healthier for me if it's called heritage, which, <laughs> which from my standpoint, I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not saying anything. I'm not, you know, the FDA laws are pretty, pretty clear on what you can say, uh, what you what you can say about something being a whole grain or a hundred percent whole grain, or um, you know, so if you make health claims relative to heritage, you you need empirical backup for that. So anyway, it's still going to mean something to your customers. So you you do need to consider all perspectives. Okay, great. I'm just looking to see if we've got any other questions here. Um, have a look. You know, I had one question mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Amber, just in terms of when you're describing, um, you know, working beans into your uh, facility and developing markets for those and recognizing the need for these longer rotations. So how do you coordinate that? Is that, do you do that through the mill or is that in collaboration with the Main Grain Alliance or how do you, how does that how do you negotiate that? I guess. Um, I mean, that was um, that was the, the mill's decision to launch that line. Um, and just for clarity, for people on this call, uh, the Needing Conference uh, started in 2007. It evolved into a nonprofit organization called the Maine Grain Alliance. That is a nonprofit that still hosts the conference, baking education, a seed restoration project. Uh, it raises funds to give technical assistance to grain-based businesses. 
we started the mill as a for-profit entity. So, um, so I'm involved in both of those, but the mill is, is a business. So, so the mill made the decision to launch that line um, and uh, sort of tell the story of why it's important to grow legumes and pulses with grains. I think there's other fun stories to tell. Like I told you the compost story and oat hulls being used instead of vermiculite. Um, several new members of our local farmer's market this year are vendors starting businesses using our products or byproducts. Um, one is a mushroom grower who is local and using the oat chaff to make a medium for growing mushrooms. Another vendor, hold on to your hats, is using the byproducts to grow mealyworms that he will sell to backyard chicken producers and people who just like to feed the birds. Um, because those grain byproducts and the dust and all of that is wonderful food for mealyworms. He hopes to take that to edible insects uh, eventually. So, um, and then we have another vendor coming uh, with a new pasta product. So um, these are all really fun stories and ways that help us stretch our thinking about what our products are good for. That's great. Um, let's see, we have time here for one more question um, from Odessa here. It says, thank you both Amber and June for your excellent presentation. I work with home bakers who struggle with terminology that though intuitive to the industry, like high extraction, can sow confusion to the home baker. Terms such as sifted or bolted. What is keeping millers from settling on one term? <laughs> I'm just laughing. I'm yeah, I was like because I saw something recently and I was like, did you have to did you really have to put that out here? <laughs> Cuz I agree with you. I think we're, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Um but, you know, then I go back to like there's not a whole lot about wheat that is actually simple. Um that's it's always been complex. Uh but you know, Amber, I'll defer to you on this one. And you're, you know, thinking in discussions with other millers. Sure. You know, my guess is it's just, you know, personal style or maybe trying to differentiate. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say it's a work in progress and we're learning as we go. There's old fashioned terms that I don't hear so much anymore, like clear flour. And that implies a certain um, grade of wheat and, and preparation of wheat. Um, we've got customers that feel very strongly that they want to know if any brand is being sifted out because their ethic is that they want as much whole grain as possible. And if we're calling something all purpose, but not disclosing whether it's sifted, they want to know. Um, uh, I just had uh, an interesting sort of realization with a distributor that that we're careful to try to use the language of the home flower user by, by using the term all purpose whenever we can. But when we're serving bulk bags to um, commercial users, we know that they want a little more information and they, they have a more sophisticated understanding of extraction and what percent of extraction. Um, so we communicate those things on our bulk bags, but we weren't using the exact same language on bulk as we were retail intentionally because we knew they were different audiences, but it was throwing off some of the, the middleman communication for the distributor. So the distributor was saying, my bakery wants an all-purpose flour. I'm trying to sell them your sifted 86% extraction. They think I'm sending them the wrong product, right? And, and yet in our retail bag, we call that an all-purpose flour. So anyway, there was a disconnect and that's on us to to, to clean up or streamline the language so that we all know what we're talking about. I've got another expert in this field um, who really wants us to put out a flower that we call white, <laughs> that is stone milled better white. And, and the, the argument being it's the highest extraction we make. He wants to know that that is the finest thing that you make. It's a beautiful flower. And why don't you just tell people what it is? It's it's better than what, you know, so, but you, you, you float that idea to other customer groups and they say, why, why would you ever want to use that word? That's the bad thing. And, you know, so it, again, it's all perspective taking. And I think, um, you know, you need to get, get information from your customers and users and, and learn what makes sense to them. 
Yeah, um, David here in the chat put a comment and he said, um, you know, his answer would be that it, because it's a business that's been around for 10,000 years, there's a lot of nomenclature. So, yeah. It's definitely a good, uh, you know, I think that's it's a really good discussion topic for the Miller's Peer Group. Um, but, you know, going to the question about white flour, you know, I would almost reserve that for roller milling in a way, you know, where, and that would be an interesting conversation. But I think, you know, white flour is roller mill, not all roller mill flour is evil, um, but it's really about starch, right? It's like maximum starch extraction and white as far anyway so thank you so much june and amber for this great presentation and um thanks everyone for joining us today thank you alice thank you thank alice thank you june good to see you all